Well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you again for joining this week's office hours with Infinex. Um, we are, as promised, doing our um, credentialing services part two. I know a lot of us were on the call back in May. Um, we, again, are hosted by our infamous Bo Bowman, our SVP of Strategic Accounts for our Credentialing Services, and really just here to talk a little bit more deep diving into our current challenges in the environment post-pandemic when it comes to credentialing for providers and with payers. Um, Bo, would you like to say hello to everybody? Sure. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, just need to be a part of this kind of follow-up. I thought we had a really uh, neat session last time where we hit on kind of the, um, you know, kind of the, the disciplines of credentialing services that a lot of our clients or soon-to-be clients could um, run into. And um, uh, you know, Infinix is, is kind of deeply rooted in um, partnership with all of our clients. And um, so we want to make sure we're bringing the latest uh, kind of trends that are going on with enrollment and credentialing. And that's what we're going to hit on today. Great. Um, thanks so much, Bo. Um, and again, our um, Q&A is open. So if anybody wants to contribute and ask any questions during the session, please feel free to put it in the chat and we will be able to bring that up. Um, so with us getting started on the first question that we've got for Bo is what are the common problems that payers and providers are dealing with when it comes to enrollment? Sure. Um, so uh, a lot of pain points here that, you know, we've seen probably this um, calendar year kind of uh, continue um, really going all the way back to kind of say spring of 2021. So, you know, we're really a um, couple of years into it and um, we hear it quite a bit. So, you know, um, specifically with payer enrollment, um, as I've talked with our team and, um, you know, kind of other folks in the industry, delays in communication from the carrier or from the payer. Um, you know, you may have four or five enrollments out there that you're trying to get done for either a new group, new provider, um, and potentially a, a new facility on radiology, surgery or dental. Um, and so, you know, we, we could see six weeks go by um, after we've completed the initial documentation and paperwork uh, for a new enrollment. Uh, very hard to get an email or a phone call um, or a support ticket uh, kind of followed up on specifically by the big payers. And, you know, not trying to, um, um, you know, harp on them or point them out, but, you know, there, there remains to be, um, you know, a prioritization uh, issue uh, with some of the major carriers. So, um, you know, if you were to bring us along as a, as a, you know, a supporter or an extension of your credentialing group, um, we, uh, we, we have a, a strong labor team that is good at follow up. And so, you know, whether it's reaching out to a representative at that payer and just explaining, you know, hey, this is important for our client, where are we in the queue right now? And, you know, trying to define that relationship goes a long way. Yeah, you um, you talked about some of those mechanisms of communication, you know, between sending an email and it goes sure. into you for a help desk ticket, um, getting on the phone and waiting. And a lot of that, what our payers are experiencing when they're talking with the providers, you know, we're taking time out of the day for the providers to help see patients. They're trying to find documentation. So other than some of those delays, are there any other delays that we have and that we're aware of that we've solved for with even new or re-enrollments um, on the payer side? A couple of points to hit on there. Yes. Um, you know, so maybe in the past, uh, there was a kind of a, a regular communication flow with the uh, payer, or specifically with the with the teams that were receiving the enrollment documentation that we're sending. And, um, you know, there was an honest conversation there about, you know, hey, we have not uh, been able to process your four or five enrollment applications. Um, we understand you need to start the provider. Maybe they're a surgeon on call. Um, you know, where they're meeting community demand. And so on that note, um, we would, you know, if you will, open a case with a payer. Um, and so if we generated, say, 100 claims uh, with that uh, provider for a potential payer uh, group, then those claims would be held. And, uh, you know, as that provider's enrollment was finished and they became par on the plan, then we would go through and, and, and file those claims. Um, so now you're getting into the kind of the concept of, you know, retroactive approval, um, on authorizations to have those claims paid. Um, quite simply, those days are over. Uh, there's, there's not the labor uh, staff. Uh, there's not the follow-up 
um, that the carriers have in place right now for that to happen. So, um, you know, we just want to uh, make it clear that if you're to bring in Phoenix on as, as your, you know, support team there, then, you know, we're going to um, have pretty hard and fast deadlines on when enrollments have to be submitted. Um, and we're going to work with the client to explain, hey, yeah, you you may have to start, you know, that particular provider at a certain time, you know, but here's what you're looking at. Um, you know, based on the communication that we have back from the payer now in, in the instance of any retroactive authorizations we may need. Um, but again, you know, payer labor shortages, um, payer staff, you know, uh, to do these enrollments after we've submitted them. Um, it's a real challenge for them right now. You know, they, they're having to work through what work from home policy looks like for them. Um, just like the rest of us are. And, and unfortunately, I don't think that leads to the same level of productivity that we saw, you know, prior to the pandemic. Okay. You had mentioned uh, about retroactive approvals on enrollment. Um, I understand that that's um, no longer, you know, happening and that there were major delays on both sides. Why is that that they stopped working on the retroactive approvals? You know, it's it's no secret, um, you know, say January 1 to today, June 1, um, if you kind of just keep up with, um, you know, current reading in, in the industry, um, the payers have continued to hold claims. Um, you know, Becker's reported that about 33% of all provider, uh, so professional fee claims, uh, were held on payment for upwards of 90 days. Um, and we're not entirely unaccustomed to that, but it usually takes place in, say, the first 30 days. Uh, of a new year. Um, so, um, you know, hard to predict exactly uh, what carriers and payers are up to, but there's no doubt that they're analyzing the outflow uh, of claims based on, you know, what I would, what I would argue are post-pandemic adjusted volumes. In other words, they're, they're looking at the average amount of claims and volume that's coming through that they're going to have to pay out for the year um, and to ensure they can meet, uh, you know, those liability at the end of the day. They're they're analyzing that and holding some of those claims. Well, you know, that that gets back to, well, are they going to approve and pay out any sort of retroactive or, or retro authorizations that we need, um, you know, to ensure that although we submitted the enrollment on time, maybe 60 days, 90 days, 120 days in advance, um, due to delays that we've recently discussed, we're still not going to have, you know, that particular uh, group or that particular provider you know, par on that plan, but we have to go forward and see, you know, X amount of patients. And so a very difficult time to say the least. Um, but again, if, if you choose to come along with us, we'll assign, you know, at least a couple of people to, you know, your particular case or your particular uh, need. And then we've got very skilled uh, managers that oversee our teams and, um, you know, have between 20 and 25 years of experience on working with the carriers to, to try and find resolution. Great. Um, as far as lack of seasonality in a provider and the payment enrollment, what can be done to help improve that knowledge and, and bring that information into both sides of the coin? You know, um, that's a great question. And, you know, kind of what we're doing today is um, now that we are kind of post pandemic and we can get back into some of the offices and kind of uh, meet with, with either the principal, you know, maybe that's an administrator. Um, that has, you know, one or two people in the office that are responsible for, you know, some of the credentialing and enrollment and, and specialist work. Um, we, we love to get on and do some training. Um, we love to get on and kind of do some auditing. Um, so, you know, we'll bring in a manager or we'll bring in one of our credentialing specialists and we'll actually work, you know, with the client's team. So, you know, uh, the tough part about the seasonality piece of this is, you know, say early summer, you've got a big group of uh, you know, medical residents that have finished their residency and it's time for them to have signed their employment and then they're going to go out into the world and, and start their, you know, start their careers. And, you know, oftentimes there is a book of patients ready for them to see, you know, come August or September. Well, that's really tough because we, you know, we really need to move their enrollment down the road and, and move their applications down the road. And you can't really do that until June or July because they don't have all their licensure in place. So, you know, this is pushing us back to September, October, November, and that's a really, you know, tough start for a first time person. So, you, you know, again, just kind of being able to follow the, the path of what the carriers are doing and what the trends are and, 
you know, again, we'll go in and educate a, an office or a group of people on, hey, this is exactly how you fill out all the enrollment forms. These are all the necessary documentation you're going to need. We'll audit that for them and help them submit it um, in a way that, you know, hopefully is accepted first time. And we've seen that recently. We've uh, recently brought up a couple of uh, surgical practices, neurosurgery, and some pain management practices. And, um, you know, by submitting all the documentation correctly the first time, you will get, you know, a response from the payer that says, hey, we've approved your application. Well, that's, that's important, right? At least we're hearing from them. At least the application is clean. That does allow for the communication stream over those next 60, 90 days to go very well. Whereas if you submit either an incomplete application or an application with dated information or an application without the right kind of licensure, et cetera, you know, you're exactly, you know, kind of off to a slow start there and that can cause more delays. You know, back in earlier conversation, we talked about the modalities of communication between providers and payers. Um, what are some of the winning strategies, not only other um, enrollment agencies, but specifically Infinex does to ensure the bi-directional flow of that enrollment information? Sure. Um, you know, probably getting into a little bit of technology, you know, kind of function here. So, um, you know, we see this maybe in the dental HMO space, um, in the anesthesia space, um, you know, GI, you know, basically where you have large groups. Um, and it's it, so it's really important that, um, you know, you're not just going to use one or two or even six people um, to help process the level uh, of application and, and enrollment need that a group like that's going to have. So um, no doubt we have a, a very smart team in place led by engineers um, that know how to put together algorithms that ultimately allow us to use, you know, some version of, of artificial AI, um, you know, to be able to log into payer portals, to be able to log into hospital portals, um, to be able to hit on a very regular basis um, uh, those sources where the information for approvals lives. Um, so, uh, again, we'll sit down with the client and we'll walk through, you know, hey, oh, you have 15 facilities that you need brought up. And you know you need your 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 facility ID properly credentialed and enrolled, and then you, maybe you have twenty providers you know per facility. How can we help with that? So again, we'll sit down and kind of walk through how an algorithm can be put together, um, so we can put you know some AI to work to help with um, really what becomes a very constant and regular update to communication as to where both each provider and each facility is um, in their journey. Uh, potentially to get approved with a given payer for claims processing. So as far as preparations for doing enrollment for a provider, um, there's checklists, there's lists of documentation that, that need to be prepared. Um, what are some of the, the items on that checklist? And then what are the requirements that functions can be automated with that? Sure. We love, we, we tell all of our clients, you know, let's start with your CAQH profile. Um, CAQH is, is very important and a lot of people think I, I fill it out once and I'm good to go. Well, no, we've we've worked with clients where the CAQH profile expires. It needs to be updated. Um, you know, maybe there's an additional board certification. Um, maybe your boards have have run out and expired and you've got to go back in and renew them. All of that information or, or maybe you've taken on some new licensure. Um, all of that information has to be updated on a very regular basis. So again, having that personal relationship with the provider, with the group, to be able to say, oh, you know, this nurse practitioner, um, you know, she's moved up to being a nurse anesthetist, and here's all of her documentation. Well, we have to take that and we have to go load that in those profiles. Same thing with your state standardized credentialing application. Your state standardized credentialing application for a given provider needs to be updated on a real regular basis. So, so what do we do? We basically help you put together a portfolio for each provider. And if you have software to do that, then we can work inside of your software to help you. If it's a manual process and we're just maintaining it through Excel or maybe a project management software, um, we'll help you do that too. So in some instances, maybe it's a, a small four-man family practice and, and you know, we'll have a portfolio built for each one and we'll work with the client to make sure the portfolio has all the updated licensure. So when we go um, try to get you enrolled on that new Medicare Advantage plan that's new to the market, you know, we've got four updated portfolios. Or maybe if it's a much, much larger group, um, then we'll either work inside of your software or we'll provide software um, to keep those portfolios updated as we go through and, 
um, you know, try and complete, a, a, again, you know, maybe a new enrollment for a new plan that's, that's new to the market that you've had an updated letter of, of intent signed on. And, and I can't go without saying, you know, before in our last call, we talked about white, um, white glove service, our customer mm -hmm. service that we offer. And that really goes together when it comes to all of these steps that have to happen, whether it's automated, whether it's through those different modalities of communication, but the staff that, that we have is able to help and solve for any of those situations. They've got enough experience to be able to help smooth that transition. Sure. Um, so great. Um, what are the pros and cons of implementing a new software um, and, and expedite that enrollment process? Sure. Just kind of building on what we were just discussing. Right. And so, um, man, there is a lot of options out there today. You know, if you just Google either credentialing or payer enrollment or credentialing specialist software, um, you know, you get 12 or 14 hits back pretty quick and it can be daunting. Um, to kind of figure out what's right for you. So a good, good time to, um, you know, look at service agreements with us and, you know, we can come on either on a consulting basis or, um, you know, if you want, we can take on the full implementation of a new software for you um, or advise, uh, you know, maybe what will be the best for you. Another important thing, um, I would say, you know, one of the pros of having a, a, a credentialing software or an enrollment software is, um, you know, once all the data is in the software, it does a really good job. And, and you know, whether it's, um, you know, one app or credentialing stream or, you know, so whatever some of the big ones are out there, um, we can go in there for you and we can set up reminders. Um, we can set up tasking. We can set up uh, purging if a provider is, is, is done and is leaving the group. And then we can have it send out updates to the principals in the group as well as our team. Again, so everybody's on the same page. So, you know, I would say, if you will, it's a, it's a good GPS to understand, you know, what's going on on a month to month basis um, for your enrollment and credentialing service. You know, I'd say some of the cons is, you know, is work intensive as it is of tracking everything with manual spreadsheets software can be pretty work intensive also, right? And so it takes training. You got to get everybody trained on it. So, you know, that's that's arguably, you know, it could be a challenge. And then there's folks that still may have a learning curve and, and um, are so used to moving through, you know, how they were doing it in spreadsheets or maybe smart sheets. Um, and now they got to, you know, use the application. So a um, little bit of ramp up there and, and then there's the expense of it, right? You got to kind of figure out at the end of the year and you're paying the monthly subscription dues on that, you know, has that been worth it? And, you know, I would argue if you're, if you're trying to produce clean claims and, you know, keep your denial queues very low and, you know, not have any denials due to either authorization, credentialing or similar issues, then, you know, I would say a credentialing software that is affordable and fits your needs is, is probably a really good idea. Yeah, like you said, there's a lot of moving parts that go along with it. So depending on the staff and the offices and in the hospital systems, even on the payer side, it's really, you know, a lot of effort that has to go into credentialing providers and for services. Um, what are some of the similarities um, between the enrollment um, for a payer provider and a hospital credentialing for appointments and reappointments processing? Um, great question. And yeah, so we want to make sure that we kind of cover all basis and this kind of second part of, of credentialing services follow-up. Um, you know, so the hospital is a little bit different space, right, than just straight, say, payer enrollment or provider enrollment. Um, at, at that point, the hospital is kind of leading the way, and, and we are attempting to, um, you know, make sure we're in alignment um, with all of the documentation that needs to be submitted. Uh, deadlines get very, very important, um, in my experience, in the health system and in the hospital um, arena, um, you know, there is a credentialing committee that meets each month, um, and it may be for specific credentials that have to be released, or it may be for, you know, just new privileges that a provider is coming on or renewal of those privileges. So, you know, the hospital has its own set of requirements um, that has to be met. And again, um, in Phoenix, and our group can come along and, and have those, you know, set of requirements shared, and then we'll assign and task out to one of our team members um, to come alongside, you know, either the provider group or whatever that may look like and make sure we're hitting all of those requirements. Um, they can get quite detailed, right? We have to go back and pull, say, years of procedures um, that that particular provider did to ensure um, they met the minimum procedures needed uh, to be recredentialed for services allowed, maybe in the cardiology surgery 
um, or other procedural uh, space. And so um, the appointments and reappointments inside the hospital credentialing space are, are arguably a little bit more complex because the forms aren't always the same. They're not standardized. There's no CAQH or standardized credentialing application or Medicare rules that apply and those types of things. So it's it's really us really trying to kind of help you develop, you know, what exactly your hospital is going to be expected uh, to want out of the provider. And again, building that portfolio of knowledge where we can both share and upload documentation to it, uh, to include an initial discovery call with the provider, him or herself, um, to ensure we're getting, you know, everything that they think is valuable and needed in an upcoming reappointment or a credentials committee that they may have to attend the meeting and attest to. We talk about all the documentation that's required and you know to be organized and prompting submission for appointments and reappointments for licensure training specialty and history work of the predator what is the best strategy to really handle that to make sure the outcome is positive and and get that um, disposition of approval sure you got to have a monthly meeting Right. And this is one of those things that I know that sounds so simple, but this is one of those things that really fell apart during the pandemic. Right. Um, we literally had medical practices attempting to function, see all of their patients virtually, send all of their clinical administrative staff home um, and attempt to have them work for home. Well, you know, credentialing and licensure and, you know, portfolios kept for each provider. A lot of that kind of went to the wayside. And so 16, 18, 20 months goes by. We haven't looked at those things. There's been tons of expirations, um, you know, maybe on licensure, um, both at the CMS and at the state level. Um, so, you know, now you're a little bit behind the eight ball. Uh, great time to, to look at Infinix services, right? We can come along and we can do an audit. Um, of your documentation for each of your providers. We can match that up against a reference guide that we have that we can supply you and kind of, again, work hand in hand to make sure you have all of the documentation needed that you're either going to need for your hospital appointment, you know, potential payer re-enrollment, um, those types of things. And, you know, so again, whether it's us just coming alongside of you and helping you build your own internal system or maybe providing a project management so um, software uh, opportunity that you can um, sign up for and use are, are all, you know, helpful things that you can do, um, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, credentialing services as a whole, enrollment services are a whole, um, I don't like to use the word necessary evil, they're, they're not a necessary evil, but if you don't do these administrative functions correctly, it will interrupt your cash flow, right? It will interrupt your claims processing. And, um, you know, we saw this from really the summer of 2020 to, um, I would say, the fall of 2022. Um, the problems aren't as bad now, but I think there's a lot of shortcuts um, that, you know, some, some folks are out there taking. And sometimes those shortcuts work and they're great, but many times you you know, you find yourself paying FTEs and associates to just be on the phone with the with the payers all day long, and, and that's not a good use of time. And so um, we'd love the opportunity to come alongside and help you. Well, um, thank you, Bo, for all of the information that you provided for us today. Um, any last comments or suggestions that you'd like to bring up? You know, I, I think the labor topic is a big one. Right. The labor topic is what really drives this entire conversation. You know, maybe prior to the pandemic, um, you had that nice loyal one or two or three or four people in the office or maybe you were utilizing a service. And then, you know, really a lot of that kind of broke up or um, dissipated, um, you know, again, really over these past couple of years. And now there's a bit of a restart. We're trying to figure out who's going to come in and work in the office and who's going to continue to do these services on a kind of work from home basis. And you know, that's a lot of stress to the administrator or the principal of the practice. And, you know, there's there's a real benefit at the end of the day saying, hey, I'm going to have a vendor take care of this, right? Because I can I can hold that vendor accountable on a monthly basis. And and really paying that vendor is, is at the end of the day, is quite a bit easier than, than maintaining one or two or three associates, their pay, they need annual merit increases, they need benefits, they need all of those things. So, um, I've been on both sides, right? I've, I've been a medical practice administrator, a health system administrator, and I've been on the vendor side. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'd, I'd be looking for a vendor partner that can help me through all of these kind of, um, if you will, spikes and, and peaks and valleys in, in the labor, uh, not just the labor shortage, but lack of labor expertise in some of these very acute and complex areas, such as enrollment, such as hospital credentialing, 
um, and such as again how to navigate technology and um, you know let Infinix bring some of our technology solutions to the table to to help you out and, and really lessen the burden. Well, again, thank you, Bo, for all of your expertise and, and joining us again today. Um, I do want to thank everybody on our team um, for putting this together for us on a weekly basis. It's very much appreciated, and all of you for joining. Um, we will be in touch soon for next week's seminar. Um, again, I'm Melissa Fogner, and um, if you have any further information, um, inquiries about Infinex, feel free to come to our website, and we will be in touch with you soon. Take care, everybody.